video, uh, the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. Uh, so we'd like for you to watch that as the ushers go back, but let's pray. Father, Lord, I want to thank you so much for Lifeline. Lord, I know we've had several kids come through here just in our youth groups who go to Lifeline. And I just thank you for the blessing that you've given us uh, with these kids. I just thank you for Daryl and his ministry. Uh, and I just pray that you will continue to bless that ministry. Lord, I do want to pray for our brothers and sisters across this world who are persecuted because of you. Lord, I, I pray that you give them strength, give them hope, and to stay strong in you, Father, no matter what, what comes their way. Help them, Lord, I pray. Amen. <coughs> I never chose to become a Buddhist monk. My parents chose it for me. They sent me far away to a monastery.
Sorrow is an appropriate response to wickedness as it leads us to agree in prayer with God. We stand with him in opposition to wickedness and evil. We join God in hating evil and we cry out to him on behalf of our afflicted Christian brothers and sisters. This results in his leading us to comfort, encourage, and support them in their time of need. We're going to take a couple minutes right now and with in small groups of people right around you going to pray for our brothers and sisters, whether here in this country or around the world, who are being persecuted, are being discouraged, misused, whatever they're experiencing because they believe in Jesus. So break up into small groups now and spend a couple minutes in prayer. This morning, Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have of praying for those who are our brothers and sisters in Christ, who are suffering physically, some being killed simply because they claim the name of Jesus, along with prayer for strength, for grace. 
We would pray that you give them a joy, a joy unspeakable and full of glory, because deep in their hearts they know that no matter how bad things may get here on earth for them, you are still king. You still rule, and you still control everything that happens. And our goal is not to live well on this earth, but as Paul said, to run that good race so that we can stand in your presence and be accepted as your children and spend eternity worshiping and praising you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with us again? We're going to sing an old hymn. Most of us should know this one. Rejoice, the Lord is King.
Thank you for that promise this morning, Father, that our Savior, the Lord Jesus, the price that he paid for us will always be good. There will never be a debt. There will never be a shortfall. And he will hold us in his hands. As he told his disciples regarding his sheep, no man, no one can take them out of my hand. We rest in that security this morning as we look to the future as uncertain as it may seem. And look forward to that time when we can stand before you and praise you for the wonderful things that we witnessed you do while we were on this earth. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, first of all, good morning. Good morning. Ah, glad I haven't lost a touch. <laughs> all right, we better? There we go. Uh, I want to start preaching through the book of Galatians with you. Galatians is an interesting book, and uh, there is a lot to glean from it. So as we go through that, I will uh, take opportunity to point some of those things out to you. But most importantly, I want you to understand that the doctrine of grace is huge in this book. And I don't want you to miss that. God's grace, his mercy that he pours out on us, without it, we would be undone. So if you would, take your Bibles and turn to Galatians chapter 1. I'm going to read the first 10 verses of Galatians chapter 1 this morning. That'll be the text that I deal with. I remind you, this is the Word of God. Galatians 1. Paul, an apostle, sent not from man, nor by man, but by Jesus Christ. And God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers with me. To the churches in Galatia, grace and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age. According to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. As we have already said, so I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let him be eternally condemned. Am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. Would you join me for prayer? Father, as we come to this passage of scripture this morning, I pray that your spirit, which lives in each of your children, would enlighten us. We need to understand the truth that is here and even though some of these things are introductory in nature, we see those things laid out before us that Paul is going to deal with in this book, this epistle. So, Father, I pray that not only would that enlightenment come, but that you would, through the power 
of that spirit that lives in us. Teach us that truth so that we can apply it to our own lives, our own hearts, that we may walk in obedience with you. But we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
greetings to the people of the churches in Galatia. So now, as we look at this prayer that he gives to them, he starts off by saying, grace and peace to you. Now, he uses those terms often. Grace, which is unmerited favor, that is, God is giving you something that you don't deserve, and then peace. We all want peace. They want peace in the Middle East right now. It's not going to come. There's only going to be one person who's going to bring peace to the Middle East, and that's the Antichrist. It's not going to happen before that. They're going to call for it, just like they're doing today. But it's not going to come. We can only get grace and peace from one place, and that is God himself. This world cannot give peace. There is no satisfaction and fulfillment that the things of this earth can provide to you. You can pursue them as much as you want, but you will not find peace. People have, throughout the millennia, tried to find peace apart from God, and they never do. Whether it's a Buddhist monk in a temple, or whether it's somebody trying to have all the, the riches of this world, it will not bring peace. There's always the next thing to buy. There's always the next level of internal peace that they're looking for. My friends, you must understand where it comes from. Now, Paul himself said in the very beginning of this epistle that he is an apostle not from men nor by men, but by Jesus Christ himself and God the Father. He is claiming that his Paul is from God himself. And in essence, that is true of each one of us. God calls us to himself. He alone can give you the result of you answering that call. And that is grace and that is peace. Grace because you are now being free from the power of sin. It will no longer have a devastating effect on you that will separate you from God for eternity. Your sin is forgiven when you receive Christ. And when you do that, you now have forgiveness. And that is God's grace. That's the manifestation of it. And the result of that forgiveness is peace. So if you struggle today in not finding peace in your life, it's because you have not taken hold of that forgiveness that God has given to you. Whether you need to give it to others or you need to receive it, that peace will come when you make that step of obedience. You free yourself by forgiving as you have been forgiven. And God wants you to have peace. He knows that for you to exist in this world, you must have grace and peace from him. You will not be able to live under the sun without it. It will destroy you. And that is not God's desire for you. He doesn't want you to be destroyed. He doesn't want any of his children to suffer or be destroyed. When we see the persecuted church, it just rends our hearts because we know that that rends God's heart. He's watching over those people. He knows what they're suffering from and whose hand it comes by. 
God wants you to know that today, if you don't know him as your personal Savior and Lord, those things await you, grace and peace. And they come from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It was God's will and expression of his will that brought Jesus to this world, not only to show us what God looks like, but to die for our wrongdoing. And because he did that, we have redemption. We have eternal life with God in heaven forever. My wife says that when she gets there, she's going to be working in the horse barn. He does ride a white horse, right? (laughs) She may have something there. Now he talks about the idea of this evil age, that God has rescued us from the evil that is in the world. And I don't think I need to convince you this morning that evil is in this world. The atrocities that one person can wreak in havoc against another person is almost unconscionable. And it's not just in the Middle East. It happens here in the streets of the city. God watches over his children. He's there with them even in their darkest times. And he holds them in the palm of his hand. Because what is most important is that immortal soul that is made in God's image and he rescues that. Just as he's done it for those of you that know him. This evil age is evil because of Satan's dominion. He is wreaking havoc because God is allowing him to do it. He's not doing anything that is not part of God's will. Now just think about that for a minute. It's a little disturbing, isn't it? Because God understands what it takes for us to finally fall on our knees before him and reach toward heaven and call out to him and ask for him to save us. The people of Israel suffered in slavery under the Egyptians until they called out to God and God heard them and answered them. He will do the same with you. Now, in this evil age, we see God's will being expressed. He knows what it takes for us to finally turn to him. And he allows that to happen so that we will find eternal redemption for our soul. Because that's what's most important. It's not about your physical being. It's not about the strength of your flesh. It is about the strength of your spirit. And God wants that to be strong, especially in these days. He needs his children to stand tall. The glory goes to God. This is what he's doing. It's not what we're doing. But we want to find ourselves on God's side. We want to be doing the things that he has called us to do, not what the people around us are demanding of us. We as a church respond to what Jesus commissioned us with. Go and make disciples of all nations. And that means your neighbor across the street. It means the person who lives in your community. It means that family member that you've got who's not received Jesus as personal Savior and Lord. 
It might be grandchildren that don't know Jesus. God has commanded us to go and make disciples. How's that going? <clears throat> Unfortunately, when I go to the churches and the work that I do now, I find that most churches are no longer engaged in those things. They're not spreading the gospel, usually outside the walls of their church. They're not going out into the community and saturating that community with the gospel of Jesus Christ so that every person can understand. I want you to know that on any given Sunday, more than 80% of the population of your city is not in any kind of religious service whatsoever. Less than 20% is going to any kind of a church service. And that's being generous in saying they're church services. So that means the vast majority of the people that you run into every day are not acknowledging God. And they're not following him. We exist in the third largest mission field in the world, the United States. That's a sad thing to say. Only China and Russia are bigger. Why is it that we have so easily set that aside? There is nothing more important than to see somebody receive Christ as Savior so that their immortal soul will go to heaven. Amen. Now Paul understands this, and he knows that because of that, the gospel is of the utmost importance. So he now talks about the gospel because he has heard that the people in the region of Galatia and those churches are turning away from the gospel that was preached to them. He calls it a false gospel. And it came in his day through the influence of Judaizers. Now, Judaizers were people who were Jewish in their background and had become Christians. And they continued, much like the early apostles and the early church, to follow in their Jewish traditions and religious rites, and they also accepted Jesus as Messiah. We would today call them completed Jews. So they came around to the Gentile Christians who Paul was preaching to, along with Barnabas and Titus and Silas and all the others that part of that crew, uh, as they were preaching the gospel to them, they did not demand that they would follow the Jewish religion. They were to receive Christ as Savior and Lord and follow him. That was the gospel that was preached to them. So these Judaizers would come and say, no, you need to follow Moses. You need to have circumcision. You need to go to the temple or to the synagogue. And so they began to bring these other requirements into the idea of the gospel and saying that what you were taught was incomplete. You now need to add these other things to it so that you will truly be accepted. Unfortunately, we have that still going on today. There are people today who do the exact same thing as the Judaizers today. There, there are a small number of people today who are Christians, they call themselves, and they follow all the Jewish uh, regulations in addition to that. And they believe that they have the inside track and they're doing it the right way. The Judaizers of his day felt like they were doing the right thing. They didn't think that they were preaching a false gospel, and yet they were. Now, the Jerusalem Council would come, and they would deal with that very issue. They would say, no, there is not a, uh, a necessity for you to take on the Jewish religion in addition to receiving Christ as your Savior. You need to just accept Christ and follow him. You see, because Christianity transcends religion, 
It's a relationship with a living, risen God. And because of that, it sets all those other things that were pointing towards Jesus aside. They no longer have efficacy. This is about solo scriptura. God and God alone with God's word and his word alone is sufficient. You don't need anything else. And when you begin to ask for those other requirements, you're doing a very dangerous thing because now you're saying that what you're doing by following Christ is really works related. And your good works are going to speak for you so that when the time comes for you to be judged, you're going to be judged okay and get a pass into heaven. Imagine their surprise when they finally do get to heaven because that doesn't work at all. Our best efforts are but filthy rags before God. We have to understand that there is nothing about us that recommends us to God. We come to him broken, needy. We don't have anything to offer him that is worth anything in his world. He gives us everything. It's up to him to make that transaction real. And when he does, God in the form of the Holy Spirit takes up residence inside of your immortal soul. And he doesn't leave. He becomes the deposit guaranteeing your redemption. And it's because of that transaction that you, when this life is over, are translated to heaven. Nothing else matters. Not how long you were a Sunday school teacher or how much money you gave to a church or which one you belong to. None of that is essential. Amen. Now he says, those who are teaching you that you need to add works to your effort towards God, they need to be cursed and condemned because what they're doing is actually coming out of the pit of hell. And you need to understand that. You know, we as people love to keep regulations, especially if you're a firstborn. Firstborns are rule keepers, right? You firstborns out there? Yeah, you're shaking your head. Yeah. You love rules, right? Every 3,000 miles, change the oil. <laughs> right? Some of you do that religiously. If it goes to 3,002 miles, you start getting real nervous. <laughs> right? You see, the problem is we translate that kind of over into the way that we live as Christians. And the, the problem is because of sanctification. You see, when we get saved, God declares us not guilty. That's justification. But then, from that point on until we're translated to heaven, when we see Jesus, that part is sanctification. And that's where we read things like, work out your salvation. What does it mean to work out your salvation? Pastor, that sounds like you're talking about works. The very thing you're telling us isn't real. It's not about works. It's about taking on spiritual disciplines. It's about living before God in the way that he prescribes. Loving God, loving your neighbor, being the hands and feet of Christ. That has a very real part to it. That motivates us. That makes us get up and do things that are helpful to the people in our community. My friends, the community should always be glad that you're here. Amen. 
I've taken a couple little strolls around your little neighborhood here. It's very interesting. They know there's a big building here, but they don't know what it is. And I said, yeah, it's, it's a Baptist church. They said, what? Where did you say that? On the sign up. What sign? Some of them have lived here like decades. And they still don't know that. So you're a well-kept secret, I guess. When we accept the gospel, we find a relationship with a risen God that is not possible any other way. That's what God wants you to do. He wants you to develop that relationship between you and him. Because he loves you. He wants you to get to know him. That's what sanctification is all about. You're setting aside the sin that is so part of your fleshly existence and getting rid of those things. And by the way, yes, you do get rid of those things. You don't allow them to continue. John is very specific in telling us if you allow those things to continue, we can question whether you're truly saved. God wants you to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. So this gospel that is preached is one that is simple so that anybody can receive it. A small child can do it. Do you know that 85% of the people that get saved do so between the ages of 4 and 14. That's when it happens. If I would ask for a show of hands, I would see a majority of the people in here got saved between those two barriers. You don't have to convince a six-year-old that Jesus is real. He knows it. You take a 60-year-old and you might have an issue, but not a six-year-old. The thing that I find disheartening is those young children today don't know very much about Jesus. We used to be really good about spreading that news, that good news out to people in doing so uh, everywhere. It's now in small pockets, and it seems to be dwindling to the point to where when you talk to people today, you mention something about Jesus. They don't even know what you're talking about. We have already lost generation after generation of young people because we have not taught them the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and having a relationship with So he is so fired up about this that he says twice that they should be condemned if they're preaching a gospel other than the one that they were taught and that they received. Why is it that we want to find something different? I've never quite understood that. Now, Apple, <coughs> they understand that. So they bring out a new phone every year. Bigger, better, faster, brighter, more expensive. <laughs> and people line up, man. You know? And then that thing ties us like a, a tether. No matter where you go, it's buzzing in your pocket. I sit down around people. The ones that are really cool. <laughs> That's a trick with the size of some of those phones today. We have to care about the heart. We've got to care about people. Because it's people that makes a difference. Now as he gets down to the end of this passage, he talks about approval in verse 10. He says... Am I trying to win the approval of men or of God, or am I trying to please men? And the answer there is no, I'm not. 
Because if I was doing that, then I would not be a servant of Christ. Boy, does that tell us a lot. If you're a man pleaser, you're not a God pleaser. He makes that very evident. Where do you find yourself today? Man pleaser, God pleaser. All right, so let's take the opportunity to just uh, conclude a few things. Let's do a so what here. All right, out of this passage of scripture, first of all, we see that Paul was not accepted by everybody around him. Does that describe you? I can remember when I was, uh, I think about fifth grade, uh, my parents uh, worked very hard to give me some clothes to wear to school. And uh, by the spring of the year, those clothes that they bought me were now um, allowing me to walk in a stream without getting my pants wet. <laughs> and I remember standing uh, in the line to lunch and the younger kids were going by making fun of my pants being short. And I thought that was horrible. Why were they making fun of me? These were the best pants that I had. You should see the others, right? I wanted desperately for them to like me and accept me. People want that all the time, even today. When we go up to somebody and talk to them, they want to be accepted by us. They want to be noticed. They want somebody to see that they're there. One of the things my wife does is she, she doesn't know a stranger. So she just, uh, you know, we went to the doctor the other day up in Chicago, sit down. You know, we're in this big high-rise place, you know, and we plop down, and there's a couple sitting right there, and she says, hey, how you doing? You know, lady starts talking to her, you know, and they're talking back and forth and having a good time. And then she got called to go in, and they're still talking to me, and I'm like, wait a second, I didn't start this conversation. <laughs> She talks to them in the grocery line, you know, at the store, they're walking along, she waves to them, you know, like, who's that old weird lady that's doing that, you know? They just want to be noticed. Try that sometime. Just say hi to somebody. You may scare them a little. <laughs> it's okay. You know? Flip their phone while they're talking to you. You know, it's all right. Paul was not accepted. It's okay. You don't need to be accepted by everybody either. There's only one person that you need to be accepted by, and it's that one. Amen. Grace and peace come only from God. If you desire those things that I know you do, the only place you're going to find that is in a relationship with a risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is the only way to find grace and peace. You need to reject the false gospel, and today the false gospel is that you can name it and claim it. That God wants you to be wealthy. The best day is the one that's coming. There's no heaven. There's no hell. God loves everybody. Reject the false gospel. Jesus Christ paid a horrible price for our sins. And he did so willingly because he loves you. And he loves me. Satan will do his very best to deceive you. He'll make you think that doing the right thing is going to count for something. People get drawn aside by those kind of things very subtly. But you know, having been in a lot of churches, you can't judge people by their outward look or what they smell like. 
I can remember in one of my churches, I had a guy who uh, drove truck overnight. He did deliveries at nighttime. And he would come to church with his uh, blue shirt, blue pants on, and his hat. And he was all dusty because he'd been delivering stuff out of his truck all night. He didn't smell all that great. And he'd been working hard. He was there in church. That's right. Sometimes there's people who just come wandering in. They don't look so good. You can tell they've been up maybe for a couple of days, looking a little haggard. What you don't know is they've been trying to figure out how not to kill themselves. And they wandered into your church because they maybe thought there might be some hope. Sometimes that little old lady comes in and she's lost her husband. She's all alone. I had one in my first church here, her name was Miss Grace. Used to have a prayer meeting, it was her and I. Just the two of us. She got killed crossing the street coming to church, prayer meeting. She got hit out on the road, down for her, about 19. You don't know what people have been going through. Don't judge them. God loves them. Amen. You need to love them too. Amen. And finally, are you trying to please men? Or are you trying to please God? Let's pray. Fathers, we close this portion of the service. We ask that you would speak to our hearts through your spirit. I ask, Lord, that you would help us to answer that question, are we trying to please men or are we trying to please you? We want to find ourselves pleasing you. So, Lord, take this opportunity to speak to us even today. You've asked us to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow you. May we do so today. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with us again, will you? The only anchor, the only sure foundation we have is Christ Himself.
into the next, presenting you before the throne of God the Father Almighty without spot or wrinkle. To him be all honor and glory and majesty both this day and forevermore. Amen. Good morning and Maranatha. Amen. 